well, guys. Here we are. It's been a little while, admittedly. Sorry for the delay. As always, I want to get a few things out of the way right off the bat. We're not actually doing an intro video. I thought about it and I decided ultimately I only had a few things to say about Babylon 5 as a whole, and I figure we'll just say them right at the beginning here. First of all, Babylon 5 is what I would nowadays call probably a normal show. I'm, mo I'm sure most of you, uh, especially my younger viewers, are probably used to this kind of show by now. What I mean by that is a show that is, has a strong continuity to it, a.k.a. is an arc continuity, where each episode affects what happens in the next episode, and there is no real status quo. Things can get upside uh, at any time. Game of Thrones, uh, Breaking Bad, uh, The Flash, all of these are good examples of modern shows that have this new mentality. I do say new because this very much didn't used to be the way things were. The most m older shows, you know, when I was growing up, the way most shows were either fully episodic, Twilight Zone is probably the most extreme example of that, or leaning more towards setting continuity. This is a, uh, The Next Generation is a very good example of that. So, yeah, I've when Babylon 5 came out and was true arc continuity, I just ate it up. I was like, oh, God, this is great. Um... And, of course, it's ironic because Deep Space Nine came out about the same time as well, but we're not going to get into that uh, ever. We are going to say a couple of things, though. See, the problem here is, with a show like this, my normal approach to television shows would be what I've been doing with Voyager. Let me talk about the episode. All spoilers are, are of course, uh, allowed, but not just for the episode, but for the whole series. Now, that doesn't really mean much in Voyager, because it's not like I'm really spoiling future things in Voyager. It's not like I'm really giving away massive secrets or character development arcs or whatever when it comes to Voyager. Because Voyager is really, really loosey-goosey when it comes to continuity. But Babylon 5? I can't do that here. So my initial intention was to go into it full spoilers, all the discussion. But then something curious happened. Um, I found out that several of my viewers haven't watched this show yet. And three people I know personally, regardless of the show, have never watched Babylon 5. And they intend to watch it with me. In fact, actually, I watched The Gathering, this episode, with a friend of mine, one of those three people, who intends to watch it with me. Babylon 5, as a result of being so strong with regards to art continuity, is definitely one of those shows that you can spoil. And is also, in my opinion, a great show to watch again. The first watch through, it's great. The second watch through, it's like, oh my god, there's so much there that I missed the first time. Because the thing is, when you have a story arc like this, when you do this kind of continuity and you plan it out in advance... You can put all sorts of foreshadowing early on. And JMS was also not married to his scripts. This is also one of his greatest strengths. And what I mean by this is he didn't adhere to the absolute rigid nature of what he had planned out in advance, which is good because it wouldn't have worked if he had. He had it. He had an idea of where he wanted to go, and he was capable of, of adapting on the fly to the changes. There were quite a few cast changes. There had They had issues with the, regards to the length of the show. There was some issues with regards to getting certain people on it and certain people not. The show had a lot of problems, is what I'm saying. And so he was adaptable enough to get that going. Now, I'm not saying Babylon 5 doesn't have bad episodes. It does. At least one I could think of. But overall, that second watch through, it's like, oh, God, that and that and that. I, I found myself seeing that. In fact, there was one thing on this watching of The Gathering that I never caught before, believe it or not. But here's the format for you guys. This is how I'm going to do this, okay? The first chunk of this show, it's just going to be me doing my usual thing, ruminating on the episode. Then there's going to be a nice big blatant warning of spoilers alert, spoiler alert. And once that warning is over, the safeties are off, and I'm just going to be talking about it with the entire show as a whole. Now, that's not necessarily going to happen every episode. I don't actually know if it is or it isn't. But I'm keeping that option in my back pocket in case there's anything I want to discuss with the future being kept in mind. So for those of you who have not seen this stuff before, including the people I know who's going to be watching this with me, you can watch up to the spoiler point and then stop. And for everyone else, you can keep watching, especially if you don't care and, and hear the spoiler stuff. And for anybody who is in the former category who, who is watching this with me... Once you've seen the whole show, I mean, these videos that I am making right now, I intend these to be on YouTube for some time, in the years range, just like all my other videos are. So the idea here is that you can then go back and rewatch these and get to the spoiler start part and be like, ah, you know, and, and see, uh, see what you missed and see what you didn't and that kind of a fun thing. So there is a spoiler section. In fact, I've got like eight spoiler points here for this episode, but that's, that's logical. This is the pilot. 
Now, for those of you curious, I watched the TNT version of The Gathering, specifically. Uh, there's a few changes, most of them cosmetic. The only real change was to a woman named uh, Tom... Tamlin Tamita? I don't actually know how to pronounce that. It's the woman who played uh, Lieutenant Takashima, or excuse me, Commander Takashima. In the original version, uh, which actually is this one, the TNT one, her lines came off as a bit too forced, a bit too masculine. And there was a lot of pushback from the network on that. And JMS, God bless him, uh, just just shoved back on that hard. It was like, no, no, her performance is fine. She doesn't see, need to sound more feminine. And they shoved it down their throats, and finally they had to relent and make her do the second take. The TNT version, this one, is the original lines. The ones where she actually is, is originally how she was supposed to sound. Uh, there's a few other cosmetic changes. Most of them are with regards to the graphics. I will say this. Um, if this is your first exposure to Babylon 5, this is probably the worst place to start, technically speaking. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um... Imagine you want to, you, someone is like, oh, dude, you need to watch Star Trek Next Generation. It's great. Okay, what should I watch? Well, watch Encounter at Farpoint. Oh, that was terrible. Why do you want me to watch this show? That's kind of what I mean. There's a lot of stiffness in the acting. The characters really hadn't been gelled out yet in several cases, even though you could see, again, some of that foreshadowing. Um, the A lot of the actors just uh, don't really have a feel for what they're doing. A lot of the line, it feels like line ratings. The cosmetics of a lot of the aliens are pretty amateur looking and will get better over time. You know, it's just generally lower quality than the rest of the show is what I'm trying to say. However, upon rewatching this, I have to say that I actually liked The Gathering. I was actually surprised by that. It only has one big flaw, which I'll talk about later uh, in the spoiler section. But overall, it feels pretty good. It feels like the kind of thing that would hook me, and in fact, probably did back in the time. I say probably because I don't actually remember if I started watching with this or with uh, Midnight on the Firing Line. I don't actually recall which. Um, this episode happens uh, one year before the first episode, one year after the commission of Babylon 5. This is in character time. So all of these events happen, and then their year passes, and then Midnight on the Fire Line starts. This is also a year after the station was constructed. This is also Babylon 5, the fifth station. Um, they discuss some of the whys and the wherefores of that. I'll get to more of that when we get to the setting stuff. Um, they had a bit of a problem with some smaller sets. They did some good directing, though, to make good usage of the terrain that they had, which was fairly limited. It does have a fairly significant 90s feel to it, and I know some, for some people that's simply insurmountable. And the CGI was good for the time, which means it has not aged well. I mean, I'm, I'm someone who counts this as my favorite show of all time, and I don't think the, the CGI has aged well, so... I just mentioned these because these are you know, some negatives you have to come over. Uh, there's some good directing. They do a lot of interesting stuff with, you know, instead of having just two characters talking to each other or the standard one-third rule or the standard over-the-shoulder rule, they'll have someone talking to someone who is actually, like, over here in lore. Like, that's where they're supposed to be, but they'll actually show them back there so you have, like, this person here and this person, like, here, and it's, it's some nice stuff. There's some good directing, and it helps flesh out the scenes, like I already mentioned. It helps make the setting, the sets look larger. And that also leads into another nice thing. There's a lot of people. Now, this is a problem some shows had about this era, where certain scenes would just feel empty. There are lots of extras in Babylon 5, and they really help pl make this face ple place feel like a, a station, a city, a place with tons and tons of people in it. And there's there's some really good uh, wardrobe design to make them feel... Well, I'm, I was searching for a word for this when I was taking my notes here. I have like two pages of notes, by the way. I was searching for a word, and I never really came up with a good word. Star Wars has that sort of lived-in feel. Uh, Firefly has that sort of old western, you know, down to earth feel, and 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 then like uh, certain other series, which I'm not going to, you know, there's the high sci fi, and there's the '50s sci fi. There's all these different cosmetic feels. But Babylon Five has something that I've never actually seen before or since, and the word I came up with was it feels common. It feels like the place where commoners would be, right? It's not bad, it's not grungy or dirty or filthy, it's not down-to-earth per se, because there's some high science and high technology on display, and it's relatively clean, but it feels normal. 
you know, you see where I'm going with this? It feels like the kind of place people would actually live every day. And again, it, it's, that's that common, it's that everyday feel to it, which I love and is a very unique aesthetic and really helps make you feel, again, like this is a city, a, a place of living, a station. This is one of the only space stations that feels like a space station, in my opinion. Now, DS9 did some good stuff with that, too, but they went a different direction with it. And good on them for that, I might add. Um, so, yeah, and they also have a fairly large amount of aliens in Babylon 5, and most of those aliens are just, you know, makeup. But they also have actual aliens in actual suits and actual uh, whatnot. So that really helps add to that cosmopolitan city feeling. You know, you, this is actually, it, Babylon 5 actually feels like a conglomeration of multiple different cultures, which is even further added by the introduction of the alien atmospheres and the zones that have, you know, completely different, uh, you know, contents of the air and, and pressure and heat and temperature and all that fun stuff. Some really great stuff uh, that helps, again, make it feel like this varied multicultural melting pot that it actually is in lore. So that's all awesome. Now, I think that's actually everything I have uh, behind the scenes wise, which brings me to my final point about the behind the scenes thing. When I've been going through the Voyager stuff, I have lots of material to pull on for behind-the-scenes information. I've got uh, interviews, I've got magazines, I've got the, you know, the wiki, I can uh, look through old quotes from all the old Star Trek sites, you know. I have lots of information for that, and I'm not too worried about TNG or DS9 either. There is not a lot of background info on Babylon 5. Most of it comes from conventions, uh, which I have several recordings of and will be watching through in their interviews and whatnot. Um, at panels and the like. A lot of that comes from interviews of JMS and the actors. And that's kind of it. There is not a lot of background in for this. So, for those of you who've gotten used to my usual Voyager style of talking about the behind-the-scenes perspective, I'm just going to warn you right now, sometimes I'm just not going to have anything behind-the-scenes to talk about. I've already looked into this a bit. In fact, there's only a couple things I have behind-the-scenes to talk about about this episode, and one of them I literally have to wait until the spoiler section to discuss. So, just a heads up on that. One, one final note before I move on. This episode does a lot of establishing, and that's good. There's Some of the dialogue feels forced, I'm not going to lie, and a lot of the presentation of the dialogue feels a little stiff, and I'm not going to lie about that either. But they needed to get your interest, and they needed to really establish the setting. This is a brand new setting. You know, if a new Star Trek came out, all you have to say is where it happens in the continuity, and then bam, okay, we're on board. Because Star Trek's already established. But imagine if Star Trek was brand new, if it had never existed before, and the first episode came out and didn't explain anything. You need that kind of establishment. You need to really go into what's going on. And I know this sounds horrible, but it's mostly for a money reason, if I can explain for a moment. Ideally, you could go to a studio, or nowadays studios are much less important, you could go to Hulu or YouTube or whatever, and just be like, look, I want to pitch this show, here's this idea. And then you could do whatever form of establishment you want, across several episodes, writing it into the dialogue, having it be revealed to the, to the viewers over time, or just dumping a bunch of exposition on the first episode. You can do it however you want. But especially when this show came out, you needed to do a lot of upfront exposition so people knew the setting. And a lot of that is established right at the front here. You know, we've got the war, we've got the different races, we've got the way they interact with each other. And again, a lot of it is woven into dialogue, it's just not done very well, but it's also not done too poorly. And most of the times it feels logical. Probably my favorite example of this is when Sinclair starts discussing his time on the line. We hear t tidbits about the Minbari Earth War throughout the episode up until his discussion of the line. And that's when it's laid out and it's like, ah, that's what happened there. Interesting. That was well done. Some of the rest of it, not as much. I don't want to call out specific examples, but the point being, they did a good job of, of giving you, this is the setting of Babylon 5, and they did a good job of leaving lots of threads hanging. And for, uh, just to go ahead and tell you, I didn't notice a single thread on this rewatch that will not be resolved in the future. So that's nice. So this is 10 years after the first contact war. In brief, Again, no spoilers. The first contact war was... Earth kind of screwed up. And we had a diplomatic incident, and we went to war with the Minbari. And so the Minbari showed up and just, just abstractly destroyed us. And then there was this final battle called the Line, where we lost, and then the Minbari surrendered. Unlike some shows 
This is not bad writing or a plot hole. This is, in fact, a very strong plot point, which is awesome. That, that One of the things I loved is when I was re-watching it uh, just yesterday, actually, for, in preparation for this video, with my friend who wanted to watch this series, he was thinking the whole time. There's a lot of points where it looks like they're saying something or mentioning something and it's a plot hole, and he'd be like, well, wait, that doesn't make sense unless dot, 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 and he'd start thinking about it. And I love that. This show very much encourages you to think in many ways, and it encourages you to put the pieces together. Uh, I, I admit I'm probably biased because Babylon 5 is also very political, very character-focused, and a very war kind of a setting. And that's pretty much my, my bread and potatoes, or meat and potatoes right there. Meat, bread and butter, meat and potatoes, yeah, whatever. It's food that I love, which I guess would make it actually sushi. But anyways, so this is ten years after the war. Humanity has started to recover. This is the fifth Babylon station they've built. Now, I find this ironic because Babylon, the first one, I don't know why they call it Babylon anyways, but anyways, they built Babylon. It was dedicated to be a, a station of peace, a place where all the different races across the, across the area, across the sector, or the quadrant rather, uh, could all combine and, and, and group with each other and be like, ah, peace, love, you know, all that fun stuff. Um, Babylon 5 was sabotaged by terrorists Babylon 2 was sabotaged, and then Babylon 3 was sabotaged, and then Babylon 4 just vanished. Nobody actually knows what happened to Babylon 4. So it's kind of ironic in a horribly d terrible way that all of the Babylons up until now have been destroyed as a means to keep, you know, violence and horribleness going when their entire purpose is the message of peace. As an aside, I like that that message of peace applies to the show itself, not just the station. In other words, one of the things that JMS was very, very big on with his episodes is, I'm not going to preach at you. I may believe A, and you may believe B, but I think that's okay. A lot of tolerance was built into the show, and it's one of the reasons why most of the episodes where there's an issue to be raised, they don't actually tell you what the right answer is to that issue. They just show different perspectives and let you make it up for yourself, which I like. So... Sinclair shows up, and the very first thing we do to be introduced to Sinclair is him diffusing a situation with a smuggler. A couple thoughts on that. First of all, good way to showcase Sinclair and his commanding style. Um, I do find myself wondering uh, at why Garibaldi, who is awesome, is shown to be worse at his job than Sinclair. But then again, it kind of makes sense because Garibaldi is better at being a detective than he is at being, well, a cop, to be blunt. Uh, we'll talk more about Garibaldi in a minute. Um, I find I've been talking, I've been trying to put words to Sinclair, and I think really what I want to say about Sinclair is that he lacks charisma. Now I don't know if this is the actor, or if this is actually an intentional part of his character. He's a good guy. He actually smiles a lot, which really struck me as odd when I was rewatching this. And he's definitely got a head on his shoulders, and he's very competent. But there is no charisma there at all. He comes across as very flat. But, well, that's all I want to say about that for now. Um, the, uh, the initial and obvious emphasis on Kosh and the Vorlons in general is interesting. It's, it's an approach to storytelling uh, which I've actually seen very rarely, relatively speaking. Most of the time, if there's some grand, mysterious power, they're either completely segregate from the situation or are completely dominating it. You know, like the Institute and Fallout, uh, well, the East Coast Fallout, to be use a good example. Everyone knows about the Institute. Everyone fears them, and they're constantly involved. The Vorlons, and Kosh in particular, are mysterious, powerful, and, like, intricately tied into the culture of everyone else. Everyone else knows about the Vorlons, and yet the Vorlons almost never actually interact with the rest of everyone. It's an interesting perspective on it. It's the idea of the of the the distant throne concept is what I would call that, although not throne in this case, but you get my idea. The the, the idea that there's it, it they did this kind of with the Sith Emperor initially, uh, 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 Vishay, over in Tor for a bit. Yeah, I know, no, bear with me, because the idea was there's this person and they're held up on a pedestal, but we like don't know anything about them. And we, we never interact with them. And every now and again, I mean, just rarely, they'll show up and be like... And they're all obvious and overt when they show up. They just show up and they're like... This. And they do it for emphasis. It's done... It's clearly, in my opinion, done deliberately. Not just in character, but out of character as well. So you know, every time a Vorlon gets involved, it's a big deal. Every time you see a Vorlon or a Vorlon ship shows up, 
They're not kidding around. This is something that matters to them. Therefore, it should matter to you. There is a sort of elitism in that perspective, though, the idea that they automatically know better and are just better than we are. And that's why I call it the distant throne idea, because to me that always speaks of kind of an aristocratic sort of mindset. Anytime the grand noble descends upon the peasants, the peasants should consider it a major offend. The Minbari. Now, this is an interesting thought. I find it interesting that the uh, Delenn actually reaches out to Sinclair with the information about the Vorlons. That, that wasn't really covered up in this episode, or, or, or followed through on, I should say, in this episode. It will be in the future. Um, like I said, there's no threads left dangling. Uh, but I find it interesting because given the violent and horrible history the Minbari and the humans have had, it's a, it's a very nice gesture for a Minbari to actually reach out to a human like that and be like, here, here's some information that I shouldn't be giving you. Um, that was a nice touch and really shows that that message of peace in Babylon 5 is actually going somewhere. You know, I just realized I forgot to give you guys my spoiler policy. Um, okay, I think I'm going to record something else after this and insert it before this. Or maybe I could just... I'll just talk about it now. Okay, guys, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I screwed up. I'm just going to talk about it now. Here's the deal, guys. I'm going to be patrolling the comments of these videos like a hawk, Okay. The rule is, you can post comments that have all sorts of spoilers for up to where we are at that episode. In this episode, in other words, I don't want you to hear you see you guys posting about anything after this episode. You can discuss this episode in its entirety. When I do the next episode next week, you can talk about this one and that one. Third episode, you can talk about the three episodes up to that point. But I don't want to see any spoilers for future stuff, okay? If you want to actually discuss it, that's what the forums are for. You can go to the forum and you can make a nice big thing that says, Spoilers, Babylon 5 discussion. We actually have an entire thread, or uh, category rather, in the forum for theory crafting and whatnot. So that's where that belongs, okay? Anyone who violates this, those comments will be deleted. I'm not going to ban for this, because that's stupid. I don't need to. But I am going to be deleting any comments that have spoilers that I feel are not acceptable. Okay, guys? Just making that clear. Sorry for forgetting to mention that earlier. Uh, okay, so I find Londo interesting right off the bat. First of all, he's already got some obvious friendship going on with Garibaldi, which makes a surprising amount of sense. Um, he also, like, right off the bat, you can see he's... I, I mean, let's look at the facts here. He's sitting there drinking, gambling. Uh, he's an ambassador. He's the only one acting this way. You know, Jakar is running around trying to play politics, and... Uh, well, Sinclair, the Earth ambassador, is running around trying to keep the station running. And Delenn is running around, well, actually, she's not running around at all, but she's kind of doing that aloof, above-it-all kind of a thing. And, of course, we don't know what Kosh would be doing. But, uh, and there will be more ambassadors in the future. But he's the only one who's just sitting in the, in the, in the gambling den, just kind of cutting loose. And he's talking all the, he's constantly giving these stories about the great empires of the Centauri, and he's constantly talking about these wonderful things from the past, and everything just comes together very clearly and distinctly for Londa Malari. Right here at the, off the bat, it, right off that very first scene, we can see that this is a has-been, and someone who knows he's a has-been, which is even worse, and someone who is resigned to being a has-been, which is even worse. Right off the bat, my art goes off to this guy. Um, we'll talk more about him in just a moment, because I want to take these notes in order. But just, I love how that's all put out there in the way he talks and what he says. Again, a good way to, to weave his character in there. Um, then there's the, there's, I just have a note here. Jakar seemed, in his approaching of uh, Lita about mating, is, is wonderfully alien, and, and I enjoyed that scene. But the funny thing is, you, you might think, oh, God, how many people out there would want to mate with an Asari? <laughs> you cannot possibly tell me that there are not human beings in real life who, if alien cultures existed, like the Vulcans, or the Asari, or the, the Centauri, or the Membari, or whoever else, that you would not actually be interested in romantic and sexual entanglements with them. So... <laughs> Uh, so, the Vorlons. Let's talk about the tactics of the Vorlons. Even on penalty of Kosh dying, they refused to let people violate his suit. 
Now, from an out-of-character perspective, we know exactly why that is. They're trying to maintain the mystery of the Vorlons. Um, from an in-character perspective, though, it actually makes a lot of sense. Why? Because the less people know about them, the better. Imagine if a... Going back to my example from earlier, imagine if the common people knew that aristocrats were just people like them. You know, they just went, they went to the bathroom and they had food allergies and they, they, they had itches and all that fun stuff. They were normal people just like them. Well, that would remove some of that mystique of the aristocrats, wouldn't it? It would remove some of their ability to command the, the authority and the aura of, of being better than the common people that they can do. Same thing with the Vorlons. It's not necessarily that the Vorlons have anything to hide, is my point. It's that they don't want you to know anything about them. They want to be those aristocrats. They want to be the kind who can look down and say, Oh, yes, I've decided to intervene with you this time. And no other times. Because this time matters, so pay attention. Again, this is all speculation, but I really get that vibe. Um... So Garibaldi, they, they mentioned pretty early on that Garibaldi is very unpopular, politically speaking. And they even say this flat out, that he's not political. That's actually a line that Sinclair says to him. And I love that because it makes perfect sense that a, a good cop, a good detective, excuse me, like Garibaldi would be very unpopular. Because he doesn't give a damn about diplomacy. He doesn't give a damn about your politics. He doesn't give a damn about who's paying off whom or who's doing this. And he doesn't care about the money situation. He cares about getting stuff done. He cares about what he believes to be the writ law of, of what is good and right, and he will, he will violate the law if he needs to. At least I get that impression from him. Um, but he ultimately just really cares about solving the case. Which brings me to another thing I really like about Garibaldi, which is in my second page here. He is very efficient. No, that's not the word I want to use. He is very competent, and he's very thorough. There's this great scene where he just starts talking, you know, up until this point, up until this exact scene, all the evidence really does point to the fact that something's up and there's some assassin and it's just dealing with this and yada, yada, yada. Then Garibaldi shows up and he's like, so, here's all the information I found. And he just starts going down the list. And as he does, you can tell he didn't just look at the surface. And that's what I like about him. He didn't just look at the surface of the situation like everyone else involved has been doing. He started digging and digging and digging. Too often, in fiction and in real life, sadly, law enforcement or judges or people involved with legality and, and detective work and that kind of a thing will look at the surface and say, Yep! Well, I know what that is because there's a checkbox there and that checkbox can only mean one thing. Garibaldi's the kind of guy who will say, Well, let's, let's get some context. Let's understand the nuance and the subtlety of this exact situation rather than assuming. I like that a lot. Um... Now, I like the scene, too, where Jakara tries to ally with the Minbari, through Delenn, against the Centauri. I like it because we get the mentality of the Narn and exposition on the war in one fell swoop. This is the scene, where, this is the, another good scene where they weave that in, where they talk about the Centauri-Narn war and how the Narn were, well, there's no nice way to say that they were brutally and horribly subjugated by the Centauri in very terrible ways, but his reaction to that is also very telling. Oh no, we were never slaves. We were invaded. We were conquered. We were never slaves. And his talking about how the Minbari were foolish, they had the humans at the, their, they had their throat, they had their foot on the throat of the humans, and they let them go. Why would you ever do something like that? That is very Narn mentality. It's not quite Klingon. A lot of people I've heard compare the Narn to the Klingon, but I don't think that's fair. The Narn have enough nuance to them, and we'll see this throughout the show, that even initially, though, I would say that's not quite the Klingon philosophy. They are very aggressive, very passionate, but that is a byproduct, not their actual, their, their mindset. They are not a planet of hats, is what I'm trying to say. It is logical for a people who have been so oppressed and so brutalized and so enslaved for so long to be acting this way to take everything as a challenge, to be defensive about everything, and to constantly push the envelope. Uh, not to spoil too much, but we'll be seeing this in the very next episode. The Narn will be expanded upon quite a bit. Not in, in general. Um, so I love this scene. It's the one I'm going to attach at the end of this episode. I love the scene where Londo drops his veneer entirely, and we just see a bitter, 
resigned, depressed old man as he's talking to Garibaldi. He's ta he's got this that that wonderful romanticization of the past, but he has this wonderful line, and and, and I've got it right here. Uh, this, there's actually two scenes, excuse me. First he drops the... Uh, Garibaldi comes to him and is like, look, I need to know what you're up to. And up until now, Londo has had this kind of... He's had a mask on. He's had this mask of, ha, ah, I'm just a silly old drunk who likes to gamble and likes women and booze. And all of that just melts as he's just staring at, <coughs> as staring at Garibaldi and that bitterness just eases out of every pore. As he's like, ah, oh, I remember when we were conquerors. I remember when we did these glorious things. I remember when we were not just, when we were not the Remoras and you were the sharks. And he's got this wonderful speech. The speeches are one of JMS's strong points writing-wise. Um, it, it's a great scene and, again, really helps to flesh out his character. Uh, so then Garibaldi starts putting things together. Um, Jakar's motivation... Honestly, well, we'll talk more about that in the spoiler section. I feel Jakar's motivation is actually very plain. Spite, posturing, and general Narn mentality. Like I said, always on the defensive and always pushing the boundaries and the limits. We see throughout the entire episode that Jakar is just involved in, in, in basically everything. He is constantly running around, like I said, playing at politics. Which is funny because the Narn are kind of new to this thing. And they even, they even stay as much in this episode. This is recent that the Narn have joined the intergalactic community. So, <laughs> you can almost tell that they're just trying to figure out who their friends and foes are. And the idea that there is someone who is neither a friend nor a foe to them probably doesn't even occur to them at this point in time. I also... I feel like there's a lot of stirring the pot to prove something in there, too. That they're literally just, oh, well, it's the kind of person who would pick a fight with someone stronger and better than them just to prove that they weren't afraid to do so. But I digress. So then there's this wonderful, great scene. This is the scene I'll be putting in the episode. It's this wonderful, congenial, honest scene. Londo is completely honest about something, and he hits a weird mix of it. He's not just honest about being a bastard. He is honest about it, he isn't proud of it. He is, in fact, ashamed of the fact that he's a bastard. But he knows he is, and he just owns up to it. And he goes up in front of it. I wrote this down. This is my weakness, my failure, and I am sorry. It's the scene, I'm not going to show you the whole scene of the thing, so I'm just going to tell you it now, in case you're not actually watching these with me, where he explains why he was blackmailed by Jakar into, into voting in, the, in Jakar's favor uh, at, the, at the hearing. And it's because his grandfather committed atrocities against the Narn years ago. <laughs> and Londo doesn't even apologize for it. It was a terrible thing. It was a horrible thing to happen. But it's in the past, and it happened, and it's done. Digging it up now is just going to rub salt in wounds, reduce his influence, and make things worse in general. He is enough of a self-serving bastard to care about his status enough to sell out someone he doesn't want to. But he is also feeling regret about that. It is a wonderful mix of multiple human emotions, and he comes across as a very flawed character. Even in this first episode, people who've, who've heard me talk about Babylon 5 know Londo is actually my favorite character. But even in this first episode, you can kind of see why. There's a lot of depth to him. There's a lot of different angles to him. And you can tell he is a very, very human kind of a character. Um, <coughs> now I like, excuse me, I like Sinclair's talk about the line. Uh, he didn't even discuss it with his lover. She never even knew that he was at the line. That says a lot right there. He doesn't even want to talk about it. He doesn't want accolades. He doesn't want the medal, which he keeps locked up in a box and hidden away. He doesn't want any of that. In his own mind, he, he and the others there were the losers of that engagement, and it was a brutal, bloody, horrible fight. His entire squad wiped out in minutes. That's not a battle, that's a slaughter. And the way he talks about it to her, by the way, great audio design. They do a lot of background audio for some of these scenes, which is really good. The entire scene where he's explaining to her what it was like being on the line. Oh, chilling. I will also say this, 
we don't actually know the full details of the line as of this point in time. But as he tells it, we know enough to know that this was bad. The line was, for those of you not aware, the last defense of Earth. Not the Alliance, not EarthGov, not human interests. They had been pushed back to Earth. And the Minbari were coming, and they were, they were coming for blood. And the line was literally <laughs> holding the line, forgive me for the Mass Effect quote, and failing at it. Completely and utterly failing at it. And then the Minbari surrendered. I like the limitation on the changeling net. Mostly because I like it when super powerful tech has limits to it. So it doesn't just become a, 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 a MacGuffin, you know, a plot device. I like it when it can be used, but it has to be used in limited capacity or it can only be used so often or whatever. The massive energy power of it, the fact that it kind of warps and distorts the person using it, that was good and I liked that. Um, then there's the fact that Jakar was behind the assassination. Or was he? We'll talk more about that in the spoiler section. But I just leave you, for those of you who have not seen this, this entire series before, with that question. Was Jakar, were the Narn, behind the assassination attempt on Kosh to frame Sinclair, or were there more threads there? Both of these are entirely viable options, by the way. Final thoughts before we get to the spoiler section, the theme. I'm going to be trying to pull themes out of a lot of these episodes because, well, I was phrasing that wrong, because the themes are all over the place. This is a very thematic show, and, and most of the episodes and most of the arcs of the episodes do follow certain themes, and this one is very clear and very obvious. Imagine this, this clothing I'm wearing right here. You know, each of these threads is functionally identical. You know, it's all the same cloth being woven together to make something stronger, right? The theme of this episode is, imagine if each of these threads were different. This one was red, and this one was black, and this one was white, and this one was made of a different fabric. But they all weave together to make this stronger cloth. Or at least, they're attempting to. That is the theme of The Gathering. Ironically, given that that's actually the name of it, and that literally just occurred to me just now. Um, that is the, the overall idea here. All of these disparage holes, disparate, I don't know why I keep saying disparage. It's actually two words I keep combining. All these disparate holes, or different, all these different pieces keep coming together to form a greater and more interesting and more powerful whole. And that is the entire idea and ideal of Babylon 5 in a nutshell. Now, this is it, guys. Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! <laughs> what? Okay. I think you've had enough of a spoiler warning, so I'm just going to give it one more. Uh, spoilers! Spoilers! I'll probably do a sound effect of that in the future, but for right now, uh, we'll have to do. So as those of you who have seen this series know, Takashima never comes back. Uh, the actress basically did not want to be typecast as a military actress, and so she left. Uh, they actually lost a couple other actors as well, and a few others would join on with the movie. But I mentioned her specifically because this is that adaptability I mentioned earlier. Again, I'm, this is your last spoiler warning, okay? If you're somehow like up from the, to the from the TV or the computer or whatever, and you forgot to pause it, and you're like rushing to pause it, this is your chance to do it. Okay, we're done. This is what I mean by that adaptability, because the original intent was always for the control betrayal character to be a human involving the Psychor and the new uh, regime from President Clark. That is who Takashima is. That was who she was intended to be. She was going to be the control. You know who I'm talking about if you've seen this show. And she was going to be... Uh, her, her uh, Jack, if you'll remember him, was going to be the other half of, of her betrayal of everything. And it fits astonishingly well given how she acts and reacts throughout the episode. If you watch it, knowing that, it's just like, ah. Uh... Now, of course, she didn't come back, so Talia and Jack ended up taking the two halves of her role, which is that adaptability thing again. Very nicely done. I mentioned Sinclair thing. A lot of people ask me, you know, who do you prefer, Sinclair or Sheridan? Now, I do prefer Sheridan. But I think, overall, the two of them are two halves of a very strong whole. And I feel like it would have been interesting if we got both of them at the same time. Sinclair, like I said, he's a good cop. He's good in the moment. He's good, he's good at diffusing a situation. He's very flat. He lacks any charisma, so he's not a good leader. But he's a good front-line man. By contrast, Sheridan oozes charisma. He is an extremely natural, emotive, charismatic person who naturally leads and naturally engenders loyalty in those around him. He's also uh, 
a lot less willing to compromise than Sinclair. Sinclair is better at being diplomatic, ironically, whereas Sheridan is a lot better at sticking to his guns and really pushing the hard sell when he needs to. Uh, a great example of this is when, uh, uh, after the Naran Centauri War, uh, I warned you about spoilers, Londo, uh, as a, on behalf of the Centauri, is like, we demand that Jakar be turned over to us. And Sheridan just stands up and says, oh, that request is denied. And the way he says it, I, I said it a little too harshly right now, but he says it perfectly. He's just like, no, no, I don't think that's going to happen. I think this also shows in the in the two commanders' uh, style of command before they took over the station. Sinclair was basically just a recruit who fought on the line and who had his own efforts and work there. But Sheridan was captain of a ship. Well, in, in charge of a ship at a certain point in time. He was much more... Sinclair was much more an army, and Sheridan was much more a navy. And I mean, no insult to either of these per perspectives in real life or in fiction, by the way. But they are very different mentalities, and you can kind of see it through their command style. Um, I also love how the Babylon 4 thread was woven in really early on. That's nice. There's a lot of threads that I just enjoyed re-watching. It's like, oh, that's going to be... And oh, God, I was amazed at how much of that stuff was all the way back in The Gathering. Um... There are a couple of those, you know, Sinclair being reached out to by Delenn. Of course, Delenn is aware of the 24-hour the thing, so that makes sense. Um, the Kosh move, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the Vorlons in general and their approach to things. <laughs> it's funny. Obviously, I know this show because I've watched it before, but I find it's funny because even trying to separate, you know, my, my out-of-character knowledge, so to speak, I look at the Vorlons as if they're the bad guys, which is funny because I know there's some debate about this, but I personally think the Vorlons are worse than the Shadows. They're more insidious, they're more subtle, but they're bad, in my opinion. And, and I know that's a, a strong topic of debate. If you want to debate Vorlons versus Shadows, by all means, hit the forums and we'll, we'll talk about it. But no, no, nothing in the comments, okay? But, um... Another thing I find fascinating is the Narn were portrayed so much as the bad guys early on. Now, I remembered this, but seeing it, I mean, Jakar is basically a villain here. And the Narn in general are portrayed as warmongers and just bastards. This will be true throughout a decent chunk of Season 1. I find that fascinating because the Narn aren't the bad guys. We know this. They are, they are a, a part of the cycle of violence, the cycle of revenge. They have been brutalized, so they want to brutalize back. And as we'll see in Season 1, they will push the Centauri. They will be the bullies to the people who bullied them. And then when things turn around again, that's going to go back in the other direction. And that's a shame. But I find it interesting because, on the one hand, I originally thought that it was just being done because, you know, there needed to be a villain in the show, but upon re-watching The Gathering and really looking into it, they had all this planned out. JMS knew the plan for the Narn and where they were going, and Jakar in particular. I think this was being done deliberately, partially to throw off the audience, to make them think the Narn were just the bad guys and then completely turn us on, his, on its heel, but also because, as I mentioned in the non-spoilers, or, or, yeah, in the non-spoiler section, a lot of the Narn mentality actually makes a lot of sense when you really think about it. These are people who have been horribly mistreated for a long time. It is natural that they would act this way, that they would be this violent, that they would be this reactionary, that they would be this having something to prove, you know? There's a reason that term having a chip on your shoulder exists, right? My final thought... I know you've been wondering, I wanted to save this for last. You, 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 if you were paying attention, I mentioned there was one thing I never caught before. And that thing is Entilza Valen. Yes, I really never caught that before. Or for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, when Kosh greets Sinclair, aka the fake Sinclair, he greets him as Valen. I cannot believe I missed that. I can't believe I never actually caught that before. And I was just like, I had, I had to clamp my mouth shut because, you know, I was watching it with my friend who doesn't know any of this stuff, and I was just like, oh. <laughs> They had that thread planned a long time in advance, didn't they? Along with the hole in your mind, and like, like I said, all those wonderful threads. But that's all I got. Babylon 5, The Gathering. Hope you've enjoyed. Next week, we'll start the episodes proper uh, with Midnight on the Firing Line, and I will see you next time. For what it's worth, Mr. Garibaldi, I'm sorry. 
I didn't think my cooperation would do him any good. Two votes for shipping Sinclair off, two against, a deadlock. I had no idea he contacted the Vorlan homeworld. And if you had known, would you have done anything different? No. No, I'm afraid not. If Commander Sinclair is a good man, I would hate to lose him. This is my weakness. My failure. And I'm sorry. Truly sorry. <laughs>